Hello everyone and welcome back to Shelf Life. This is a podcast where we discuss books, their philosophies, but most importantly, our personal relationship with a book. And today's book, this week's book is none other than Boats on Land by Janice Barriard. Now this book is a collection of short stories which is unlike what we've done uh, on the podcast before we've been discussing novels we've been discussing dystopic novels as well we discussed 1984 last week um if you didn't check that out you can always head over to our page and um watch it if you want and um we've never done a collection of short stories um and i was thinking you know if if we had to try out a new format it would have to be with this book because i think this is one of the most um uh, original one of the most beautiful books i've ever read um and i mean this is the first book that i read from janice barriat and um i instantly fell in love with her voice and i've read her other books as well and um i'm always waiting for what she has to write about and whatever she has to publish so um this is the book that we're going to be discussing today and i know that a lot of you might not be familiar with her work um for whatever reasons but um i want to introduce this book to you and i hope and pray that uh you find as much joy in it as i did so before we g- get into the book and you know the stories and everything i want to tell you something different today i want to tell you a short story about something in my own life and that relates with how i met this book and how i came about you know a lot of things um so i'm going to take you to a small chapter in my life okay let's go back to january of 2020 <laughs> uh seems like a very long time ago <laughs> before the corona before lockdown before all of that um it was january 2020 and um in bombay it was extremely cold uh, a kind of cold that you know we hadn't experienced before and as someone who you know has to get up at 5 a.m and travel to college every day by train that can be very very difficult when um the weather does not support you or the weather is not on your side so i remember that it was extremely cold um and um whenever it's cold if you live in bombay you would know that uh winter in bombay is not relative it's not a subjective concept it's very very objective um when it's cold you know it's cold it, it, there's no two ways about it and i remember that that one particular day i had an indigenous literature um uh, conference in college that i had to attend as um a student of english literature and um you know i was i was quite excited about it 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 seemed very interesting um and i had friends who were also going to attend it so i was quite excited but also very very cold um and you might you might think it's strange why i'm keep going back to that cold part but i promise you it'll make uh sense <laughs> just bear with me on the story okay so uh i go into the conference and the thing with literature conferences and i've attended a few uh <laughs> is that um you always there's always um a certain kind of crowd that you see okay and um you know you you know exactly the kind of crowd that comes to a literature conference they are some of them are extremely well read um they know every book <laughs> on the shelf uh they can recite poems uh of the top of their head and uh without any kind of uh trouble mm-hmm. there's some who are extremely pretentious of the ones who can't recite poems of the top of their head um and uh they you know they're just plain old pretentious <laughs> and then there's some who have no idea what they're doing there <laughs> and they're just there because someone dragged them or you know they're getting some kind of credit for it um so that's that but there's also another type there's also a type of um speaker you know the type of guest that comes on uh and trust me they're not all the same and that's how 
this was the conference that I found out that they were not. Um, because, um, you know, when I sat in, and this is like hour three of conference. So I'm already a bit, you know, overwhelmed with <laughs> the amount of information going into my head. Um, and again, very, very cold. Even though I'm in a closed classroom, um, it's extremely cold and I am not wearing a sweater. Um, and I can feel, you know, like little shiver, um, shivers just, you know, going up and down my spine. So there's that. Um, I am, so I, you can say I was like a little bit uncomfortable. And uh, one after the other, the, the speakers uh, on the list uh extremely again extremely well read very very um you know renowned uh, people who know what they're talking about writers who know what they're talking about you know they've been teaching perhaps for years um and they can also sometimes it can also feel like <laughs> they've been teaching <laughs> for years uh so you feel a bit jaded uh you know every time they go into a new subtopic <laughs> Uh, so one after the other, you know, you see these old men and women who um, who really do know a lot, but somehow seem a bit lost in a different generation um, and a bit, you know, not fit for the new one, maybe. <laughs> and um, you see that and, and, you know, I'm seeing all of that and I'm like, I'm taking notes and everything. And then suddenly I see... Um, there is this one woman uh, who is standing at the corner of the, um, you know, who, who's just standing behind the um, stage. And she is a, a, a th- very thin, tall woman, uh, very fair. She has a pixie haircut. And um, and she's just, she looks like someone my age. She looked maybe 19 or 20, you know. And I'm thinking, you know, I've not seen her in college. I've not seen her anywhere. I don't know who she is. Um, and just as I, you know, I'm just, just as I'm kind of uh, getting to notice little details of her, I notice that she has really thick, coal laden eyes and she has beautiful bangles on her hand. Um, I notice all of that and I realize that from the stage, my professor is calling um, her on the stage uh, to give to start the next uh, lecture. And that's when it hit me, hits me. She is actually a speaker for that day. Um, and, you know, again, with the pixie haircut, with the uh, 19 year old stride, she walks up to speak to the stage and she she doesn't stand on the podium uh, like the other guests. She doesn't stand um, uh, in front of a piece of paper but on the side of the stage but she stands right in the middle of the stage Um, and she just leans against a table that was kept um, you know just for sake and she leans against it and she starts speaking And once she starts speaking, it was like being lost in a completely different world. And I mean what I say that when she started talking about her book and her community, when she started talking about indigenous literature, and she was there to talk about the Northeast, about uh, the culture of Khasis of Northeast, and, you know, uh, overall storytelling that exists over there and the tradition of storytelling. She was there to talk about her book, Boats on Land. Um, And she started reciting a few, you know, excerpts from a book. And I just suddenly felt like all of that chill that was in me, um, that that feeling of, you know, being extremely cold and and just being uncomfortable, it just vanished it completely disappeared. And I was sitting there just listening to her talk um, and everything fell silent. And I realized I have to get this book. I have to find out more about this writer. And I can't believe I've never heard of her before. And just like that, you know, she looked 20. (laughs) Uh, She looked like a student. She looked like 
someone who I wouldn't have, you know, thought of uh, having all of this knowledge and making such a huge impact on me that day. But she, but she did. And just like that, she, you know, once she was done with her lecture, she went away. She uh, left the room. She left the conference. But that talk, I could not get that out of my mind. And that's when I picked up Boats on Land. That's the story of how I picked up. Um, and it was, it was wonderful. Now let's get more into the book. Uh, this I want to start with this little short story about how I met the book because uh, today we're going to be talking a lot about stories and the idea of storytelling. I know this is a concept that we keep coming back to a lot because you know this is something we love here at Shelf Life. But um, today I want to talk about just our stories, um, and I want to talk about the magic of being exactly where you are at exactly the right time. You know that that feeling one gets when you are where you are and you know exactly why you're there. You know exactly what led you there and it just feels right. Like that day at the conference, it felt absolutely right. That day felt like I had to hear that. I had to hear what she was saying. I had to I had to hear what she was talking about, I had to feel the warmth that came through that lecture, through that excitement, through that comfort. Um, and it felt good. And, you know, it's it's interesting because now that I think about, you know, what exactly she was talking about, uh, she was talking about her own culture. She was talking about the stories that her grandfather's and her parents had told her when she was growing up. And the fact that uh, in the Khasi community, which is a community in Meghalaya, uh, in the northeast, a part of India that we don't really hear a lot about, um, and unfortunately whose narrative has been um, suppressed and completely lost most of the times. Um, it's a narrative that we don't hear of often, and it's a narrative that is not just beautiful, but real and human and deserving of a voice, uh, of a platform, but we don't get that. Um, It just felt like I could connect to her. I could connect to her story. Like I I felt like I was part of her world. And I think that's at the core of what we do with books and why we, you know, even why we do this podcast, because we want to connect. We want you to feel like you're a part of our world. And that's what all writers strive for, you know, to make you feel like you're a part of their world. Um, And truly, we all are. We all are part of each other's worlds, right? But today, you know, with that thought in mind, I want to share something about my world, right? I want to let you into the things that I see. Um, the things that leave an impact on me and that shape um, the the corners and, you know, the nooks and corners of my world. So I'm going to describe to you just very simply um, what I see outside my window. Okay? Beyond the grills of my window, there is a very old tree. It's really, really large and... Uh, very tall and it doesn't in any way look dainty um it has a few other trees surrounding it but this one it just it it stands tall taller than all else and it's been there for as long as i can remember it's been there from before i moved to this house from before you know i developed that um that observation that this tree existed it's been there even before that just like the way language existed even before we had script even before we knew how uh, we could write you know language existed words existed even when papers didn't Um, write stories existed and this is what you know Janice Ferrier talks a lot about in Boats on Land Um, and that's that's what we're going at so that tree has been there for uh, I don't know how many years, but before I was born, 
perhaps you know it's been there for maybe more than 20 years and the thing is that since i've moved here and all the years that i've lived in my house which is probably most of my life i have seen many storms there have been you know many storms that came to our town and and a lot of heavy rainfall and it rains very very heavily here in um uh, navi mumbai it, it it's absolutely um powerful and you know winds are just too strong sometimes and i remember being very scared of the wind i remember feeling like um that everything would just fall and i remember like just running to my parents and saying it, it, it's thundering and it's too much it it's something's going to fall and i remember them saying that tree won't trees don't fall they're strong enough they have their roots um they're embedded in the ground they won't fall and i never really took that um you know into consideration or never really went back to that thought but i think you know with every passing moment and with this lockdown and everything i've had a lot of time to just sit by the window and look at that tree and um uh, funnily enough there's been there's actually been a storm <laughs> um there's actually been you know a cyclone warning and everything that came and went but that tree didn't fall and um there was no reason to cut it down even if it rained heavily because everybody knew it would not fall everybody knew that the roots went deeper than what we could comprehend um they went deeper into the ground than we could see than we could touch and feel and um ascribe something to and that's what um when when you write personal stories when you write about your culture or you write about stories that you've heard from your parents or your grandparents or about your community you know when when stories are passed down through generations that's what happens they can't be broken they can't be shaken their roots go deeper than what you can think or feel or hear they they go deeper than what you know um and this is a line that i keep coming back to and something that you know um i i, I just really like this line it 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 says some stories you know the origin of some you don't and it's very simple but i think it just resonates with me a lot um and and i think we all as human beings have some stories that have been passed down to us that that have been given to us as a gift by our um ancestors and we don't really question it we don't really think about it even but they exist they sit within us they they find a safe corner inside our minds and they just stay there and sometimes just sometimes they will come out and um even in boats on land this is what happens you you enter a world that you probably might have not heard of uh you enter a different um you know environment you enter uh northeast and i don't want to get into how um you know it's full of trees and beautiful and all of that because i can't i'm not going to be exoticizing uh the northeast anymore <laughs> i am guilty of that but i am consciously trying not to do it um and i'm not getting going to get into that but when you enter into a different world and you hear their stories and you know that this comes from somewhere beyond imagination right beyond someone one person's imagination it goes back decades and years and 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 so many families and stories um and and there is some kind of weight to it there is some kind of um significance to it that you can't shake you can't possibly shake um and it forms the culture that you live in today it forms the society that you live in today it forms you it forms the ideals that you live with um that you carry throughout your everyday life and that's what happens with that's what janice byer is trying to tell us through boats on land through the stories in boats on land as well because they all differ from each other they are not they don't have 
um, essentially a common thread. The only common thread would probably be that, you know, um, the stories are about people from the Northeast, about folklore, about um, how some kind of fairy tales and some kind of magic is weaved into what is real. And that is a part of their normal the part of their norm a part of their everyday life is to weave magic into the normal into the mundane um and some of the stories that i really want to mention here that i really really loved uh were the titular story uh which is boats on land then echo words discovery of flight and let them uh when you read the book if you have read the book you would know that these stories are absolutely beautiful um and they have the most powerful lines and i just want to read something uh from the very first chapter of this book and the day at the conference when uh janis bayat came to talk to everybody um she read out this one excerpt from the book um and it just transported me back to my own uh memories of uh just stories that have been given to me by my grandmother or by my mother and it just transported me back to that world that i come from um and the world that my ancestors belong to because that's what happens right memory lives in the crevices of time it breathes life into the dead so let's get into the first i just want to read the first page of the book to you how do i explain the word kaktian say it out loud kaktian the first a short sharp thrust of air from the back of your throat the second a lift of the tongue and a delicate tangle of tip and teeth for i mean not what's bound by paper once printed the word is feeble and carries little power it wrestles with ink and typography and margins struggling to be what it was originally spoken unwritten unrecorded old they say as the first fire free to roam the mountains circle the heath and fall as rain we who had no letters with which to etch our history have married our words to music to mantras that we repeat until lines grow old and wither and fade away until they are forgotten and there is silence how do i explain something untraceable the perfect weapon for a crime light as pine dust echoing with alibis conjuring out of thin air the ugly the beautiful the terrifying eventually like all things it is unfathomable so how do i explain perhaps it's best as we did in the old days to tell a story and that's the first page of the book um and you you realize that uh she's talking about um uh, of course her own culture and the fact that um the khasi language didn't really have a script um and it existed even before the british came in even before the missionaries came in the christian missionaries came in um and um and brought in you know christianity and it just spread it through the northeast like um like wildfire but she's talking about how that language existed before words were invented for it um and before it was uh, attempted to be deciphered it existed even before um people could make something of it um uh, you know and within every language it's not just with the khasi language but within your own language the language that you speak what are the stories that you've been told what are the stories that only you can understand that can't essentially be put onto paper because of how absurd they might seem or because of how incomprehensible they might seem what are the stories that you have inside of you that you do not tell and um uh, janis fariat said this one very very um uh, interesting thing that with oral history what happens is that there there's multiplicity uh 
there's multiple multiple versions of the same story um and that's the beauty of it that everybody has a different story that everybody has a different story of something that happened um and you know that's uh, it, it just it so reassuring and so wonderful and i remember something that i can relate this to in my own life is probably my experience with reading the bible again recently um and going ag- going over you know all the stories and i honestly feel like our religious books are you know absolutely perfect if you want um to learn about metaphors and stories and how to write stories if you want to learn about how to weave hope and faith and love and misery and betrayal and all of these emotions that we need to write right if you want to weave that into something of your own i think you need to read these religious books and i was reading the bible and and i remember there are so many stories in the bible of uh not just jesus but so many events that happen around him and the way that so many people perceive him and and there's so many different versions of it right it's written by so many different accounts and um it's not to say and it only goes to say that all of them matter that's what oral history says that all of these versions matter all of these versions make sense let everything that has breath praise the lord right so it it just it's beautiful to know that there can that it is it was allowed to exist something so complex something so um esoteric was allowed to exist even when it seemed like it wouldn't and you know just to build on that i want to read to you another um uh, little excerpt from the book and this is from the chapter sky graves i found it extremely beautiful and i think we can talk about it a little bit it was mostly at funerals that people told stories on the three night long watches kept by the ang ab bru the household of the dead when windows and doors stayed open for the spirit of the deceased sometimes a stool would tip over a wooden shutter suddenly rattle or a tumbler fall to the floor these were indications of a ghostly visit some believed mysterious signs that the one who'd passed away was making peace with the world they were leaving behind on these nights people whiled away the hours playing cards or carrom in the kitchen women would splice betel nut and fold tobacco leaves for the next day's visitors they would talk quietly of the bereaved and the inconsolable in a separate room in a musty corner a group of men would huddle around the chula giving off warmth and light like a familiar benevolent mistress there were funny stories of ceramic scenes of animal hunts that went heroically right and sometimes tragically wrong tales of journeys through jungles and wilderness involving characters they'd never met but who'd become real and intimate through years of retelling stories are told at festive joyful gatherings but the ones narrated at funerals are special because they reaffirm existence of the listeners and the narrators they are times of remembrance that haul the past into the present and keep people alive even after they are gone and this is um a, the beautiful opening of sky graves um a, a beautiful chapter from uh the collection and i really urge you to buy the book and read it but i i'm going to talk about how she uh incorporates the fact that funerals uh inherently meant something hopeful um it inherently meant a time to um assemble together and uh remember the good times the the beautiful times and this is something you know this is not a tradition that um is a very you know ancient one or that that hasn't oh, sorry that is that is a very new one or that hasn't existed um until just recently it's something that goes back years i mean this is something that we learn about 
that that existed even in the Harappan civilization or in the Egypt civilizations of the Egypt, you know, in ancient world, um, where when someone died, the the practice was not to mourn and weep and and uh, you know break stones. Um, I'm sure people did that, but it the the practice was the prevalent practice was also to be joyful, to to be hopeful, to pray, to understand the beauty of something that existed and something that has passed on to something more um it, it's that that hope i think we don't really associate that with death and funerals right and i think in my own family as well um if i can just recall you know times when family members have passed um all i can remember is that um you know everybody in the family of course gets together um and we have uh, the meal that you have after when the day that someone dies and you have that and 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 even though that there is a lot of sadness that exists in that atmosphere there's also hope there's also um just a sense of gratitude for what existed for the time that was spent for the memories that were made and this one little practice that i had that i remember now as i'm narrating this is that um on the 13th day i think the 13th day of when someone after someone passes away um there's this practice where you pray i mean it it happens in my family i'm not sure if it's a, a religious thing but it it you pray and um you know there's a a uh, feast not a feast but there's a lunch or dinner or something organized for the fa- by the family members um and um you know you get together and you pray and everything um and you leave the door open and you know it is for i think it's it means something it has to do something with uh the spirit coming in or going away or something like that um and and i thought and i always found that very very fascinating the fact that you're making way for someone to leave and for them to leave patiently so you give them time you give them those days uh to gather their things to gather their peace of mind uh to gather their memories and everything and you give them that you allow them that courtesy to leave the grace to leave and to move on to something better even better to move on to a place that is even better um and and it's a beautiful thought i mean it's it's not something that you need to necessarily be extremely sad about i mean that's not how the harappans lived that's not how the egyptians lived um it's a practice that i mean has existed for years together um and it's not i mean i'm not completely surprised that even the khasis had it um and it's really beautiful i think when i was reading the book the only thing that it made me feel i mean the thing that made me, reminded me the most of was that i genuinely really wanted to visit um all of the places that she talks about in the book and uh, she doesn't just talk about you know the uh, the beautiful trees and the beautiful surroundings and the weather and all of that she doesn't talk about just that stuff the stuff that you might expect her to talk about she also talks about the political struggles she also talks about um uh, the social political movements that happened in the northeast she talks about she weaves all of these little um uh, details into the stories uh, that she writes you know and they're all stories of um uh, love and loss and mis- mysterious creatures <laughs> um they're all stories mostly stories about things you don't understand uh about people you don't understand and that is beautiful that that the fact that all of these stories have that element have that common element that they are about uh people and stories that people and things that you don't understand but you still grow attached to you still discover a way to love is beautiful and that's just what i wanted to talk about today now we've reached the end of the episode and we've reached our final question Why do we think the story was told? I think the story was told because I actually don't know. <laughs> um I'm I I think the story was told because I think we all need to find that little corner in our minds and hearts where 
the stories that have been gifted to us recite uh, that we don't even we don't really pay a lot of attention to it and it lays dormant but it's there and i think this was the story was told because it she wanted to remind us of that she wanted to remind us of that corner in our minds and remind us that that corner is home regardless of how the story goes Thank you very much for joining us uh, on this episode and I hope you had a good time. Um next week we are going to have a book uh, which is another one of my favorites. We're going to have uh, Kamila Shamsi's Home Fire. If you haven't read it, you can always check it out and um if you have any stories related to this book or anything that you want to share with me you can always let it let me know you can always leave a comment uh don't forget to subscribe <laughs> um and i i i hope you enjoyed this thank you very much